we're back. Welcome. This still remains to be Good Morning Kenya. I am Jane Wimboy. We are on to the next segment. And this is all about my ladies. This is Women at the Forefront. Where we get to bring you fantastic women who are going beyond the limits and breaking that glass ceiling that society put there, whoever society is, that limits our women and our girls today. So this is for my young girls to encourage you and let you know that, you know, there are women out there that are doing fantastic things as little or as grand as they may be they are still championing conversations around women and today we have the pleasure of having with us Njoki Karaoke she is the managing director of Karji Industries Limited good morning Njoki good morning thank you so much for making time to be with us today thank you are you on the socials yes how can our viewers find you and interact with you Facebook um, not so great on Twitter or Instagram Inst they call it the gram yeah um, my daughters do that for me but yes I am on those how can they find you, do you would you do you remember the handle uh, at e jockey karaoke which is my Twitter mm -hmm. handle mm -hmm. Instagram I don't know all right we'll, we'll <laughs> ask baby girl to find yes. it for you before we get to close this conversation so before we get to what you are doing now let's journey back and go back to your younger days you know as a kid growing up how would you characterize your life growing up Oh, it was um, good. Yeah. Uh, grew up in Nairobi, born, bred. Uh, had a, you know, went to a girls' school, Catholic. Pretty much very, very easy, mm -hmm. if I can say that. Um, nothing to write home about, but it was really easy. Then went to college. Uh, but before I actually went to college, I went to work. And I worked for Lono Hotels uh, because my father felt that I needed to learn discipline if I you know uh, before going off abroad to mm -hmm. college and I worked for Lono at Opejeta which is in Anyuki mm -hmm. and I spent about two years there two to two, two to three years and it was the possibly the best years of my life was that the dream growing up or this is something that just came and you're like oh okay it just not happened so bad it was part of my being rebellious ah you so had that was, yes <laughs> so I was like okay well if I can do it my way, so, <laughs> so that's what I did. Uh -huh. And I enjoyed it, it was very remote, of course, uh, it was right in the middle of the bush, but I learned, I learned how to enjoy my own company, mm -hmm. which I'd never done in the city. Um, I also learned that there, was, there were very wealthy people because people used to fly in and fly out, and I never knew people owned, could own a plane. Culture shock. Culture shock. <laughs> Then I went off to the United States mm -hmm. uh, to study hotel management because I was working in a hotel, at, you know, of course, for the Londo Group. And that exposed me to a whole new world. But then I was mature and I was focused. Mm -hmm. What are some of those changes that you saw between uh, you studying there and having been gotten some bit of the professional uh, bit of the Kenyan space that you feel were integral in your journey and even helping you perform in the spaces that you ventured into after? Um, I had a child out of wedlock at the age of 24 mm -hmm. and that was sort of like a quick wake up call. Wake up call. You got to grow fast. Very. And it di I did. Mm -hmm. But I was also still focused on my school. So I said, okay, fine. You know what? This is the situation. I have to deal with it. Yes. But I'm not giving up. And I used to take her to school with me. I'd lay her on the floor wow. as I attend my class. Mm -hmm. And it was very empowering when I look back now. And um, that is what actually made me focus later on on the girl child. Um, uh, I've since had two other daughters. So I'm a mother of three children. What, what? Yeah, girl power. <laughs> <laughs> so it's... Um, it's uh it's it's a it's a very exciting journey mm -hmm. but also very worrying very i know being a mother of a girl, i have a daughter so trust me i constantly worry with all these cases that we are seeing of children trafficking um sexual violence against uh. our little children abductions it's very worrying now yeah. um how was that space when you were working there? You were, as you mentioned, you know, working with uh, and studying still with your baby girl, trying to figure out professionally. And eventually you came back to Kenya. Yeah. But just before you came back home, what was that space like? Space was, um, it was good because I was focused. I've, now I have a child. I have to make ends meet. Uh, my parents did not know I had a child, which was... Uh, um, 
was scary for me. Yeah. So eventually when I did inform them, I brought my daughter back home and went back to complete my studies. But I went there with a focus and I told myself, if I'm going to be employed, I'm going to only do... Um, Fortune five hundreds. Ooh. Yes. Goals. You know, I goals. Like I set my goals. <laughs> so by the time I was leaving there, I worked for the mayor of Atlanta, mm -hmm. who, um, in my plan, it was I was preparing myself to come back to serve my country, to work in the public sector. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen. But that was, so I set my goals and I knew what I wanted. So I came home and things didn't go as planned okay yeah and what was the particular reason for coming back home what drove you back to come back home and leave that space and those opportunities that may have presented themselves there and come back home the millennium 2000 when? if I did not jump 1999 into 2000. 2000 in Kenya yeah I was never gonna come back and it was a goal because I said you know I'm not an American mm -hmm. And I will never be. I don't belong. This is not my home. And I said, if I don't jump it, because, of course, you know, making the money there is good, though you work hard. Yes. But I said, if I don't jump the millennium in Kenya, I'll never come back. And I need to come back home mm -hmm. to serve my own country. All right. Yeah. Now, you're back home. You're in Kenya. Which areas did you venture into? I was, in, I was an insurance broker, I was a secretary, I was a receptionist, I did everything because I said I cannot sit at home. And wait. And wait yeah. for that grand job. Mm -hmm. So I did anything that came my way that would make, at least you know, to be financially empowered. And eventually um, got a job that was within what I wanted to do, which is event uh, management. Mm -hmm. So I got a job with an organization called Young Presidents Organization, and I was the chapter administrator in Nairobi, and that now began to open doors. So in 20, then I worked for Alliance Hotel, so I went back to what the I knew best. industry. And I did that for about two years, mm -hmm. which was good, it was fun, it was exciting. They allowed me to take my kids on holiday to the hotel, so it was really, it was good. And then in 205 is when I branched on my own. All right. Now, at some point, was it in 2005 where you decided to have this shift in your career or what informed the shift that came along to getting to you where you are even in this time and space, conversations around the girl child? That came way later. Mm -hmm. uh, 205, it was about paying school fees. Mm. Three what daughters is bringing in money. It, what is bringing money? And it was, I was still in a space where it's you know bills, bills, bills. So I did that for ten years. Mm -hmm. So in twenty fifth, actually before twenty fifteen, twenty fourteen, I met uh, a lady <clears throat> because we we were having a conversation about a conference I wanted to organize. Yes, because that's what I was doing then, and um, she ha casually mentioned that oh you know. I wish there were people manufacturing uh, affordable sanitary pads. Ding, 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 ding. And I asked her, what, what is that? Yeah. Always is it cheap. You know? It's 50 shillings. And she looked at me, she says, Jockey, what world do you live in? And I went back and I was very disturbed. So I went and did my own little Googling. And I realized that I live in a bubble. 50 shillings is 50 shillings to me, it's not to everybody. Yeah. So that was uh, greatly disturbing. So I got obsessed for like about six months just looking. And so through all that, I stumbled upon a man called uh, Arun. I call him Arun. His, long, his name is very long. He's an Indian man. Today he's known as the Padman. If you say the Padman in India, everybody knows him. Mm -hmm. There's even a Netflix uh, movie about him. And I got in touch with him. And he told me, I don't Skype, I don't have telephone um, interviews. If you want to meet me, you have to come to In India. Person. Oh, wow. I was on the next flight. You went? I went. Okay. And that was the end. That was the beginning of another, a new journey, a new chapter in my life. Mm -hmm. I met him, very humbling, extremely humbling experience. He deals with the poor. And he really inspired me to come and do better. What are some of those harsh lessons that you learned from um, this blissful ignorance that you were living in about 
a pad that could be going for just 50 shillings to you, but for someone else, that is breakfast, lunch, dinner. What are some of those lessons that you learned from this experience? Well, for me right now, it's that we, are, we live in an extremely selfish society. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if it's, I can't say it's ignorance because we read about it, you know about it, but we've become, I mean, I, okay, let me just take you back. I remember growing up, you know, in my home where you always had relatives yeah. from the village <clears throat> come and visit. And it was the norm. And you always knew your father or mother or somebody was being educated somewhere. It was the norm. But there's been a disconnect in my generation. Um, it's about me and my family, yeah. and that's it. And what have I achieved in terms of material? So when I look back before I embarked into this journey, is that um, it's a choice we've made to just ignore mm -hmm. and be blind. We live in a poor country. Yeah, Kenya's not a first world. So... The reality is that 60, 70 percent or more live in poverty. So that is disturbing to me because it took me so long to, to realize, figure it out. Yeah. yeah, you know, your maid is coming from the slum, but you don't care to know. Mm -hmm. So those that, those are the things that really. Well, I, I don't beat myself up anymore, but it, I did for a bit. Yeah. yeah, and when you were presented with it, you still found a reason to argue against it. Now, getting fast forward to a point where you decided to set up your company, Karji Industries Limited, was this post the trip? And what aspects or what did you actually find on ground when you were trying to venture into putting up this company that would help you achieve this dream and this mission that you had? So I came back from India and I was sold. And I was going to make affordable sanitary pads. And I did start a factory and uh, we did start manufacturing. Um, but I think my obsession when I started manufacturing, I kind of achieved what I thought was, you know, this is it. I've, this is what I have it. Need. This is the product. Yeah. It's tangible. And then I took a back seat because I didn't know how to get it into the market because I can tell you now I didn't know then. You hadn't thought I was that far ahead? I was afraid of the market because it's affordable, which means it's the poor. Mm. So how do I break it? I'm not gonna go to the slum, no, of course not. So I took a back seat and expected everyone else to do it for me. Mm -hmm. And I did that, and of course I failed. Then the second thing was that the challenges of the materials, we don't have the materials locally because yeah. we've kind of killed our paper uh, industry. And three is that I actually spoke to Darshan Chandaria who has also sells sanitary pads through Chandari Industries and he told me Jockey why on earth are you manufacturing everybody else is bringing them in already made because they're they're tax free mm. now I'm bringing paper in which is taxable so how do I compete you can't compete, you can't compete so it. it basically so I've, right now I can say my brother told me um, you put it put it in the back burner don't say it's over so it's on the back burner mm -hmm. uh, to be revived later um, but it kind of opened uh, this whole new world to me because as a result of that I was asked to donate sanitary pads to an organization called uh, YWCA and when I did when they did I said of course absolutely I'm happy to do that and um, they asked me if I could come and talk to the girls mm -hmm. so I said where Hiya. They said in Kibera. <laughs> I said, Ay, you better give me a soft landing because <laughs> I've never been and I'm not trying to, you know, go to places that are scary. Yeah. And they did give me a soft landing, which was a um, uh, uh, school. Of, I forget it now. But um, it, was, it was interesting mm -hmm. and I got curious. So about months later I called a guy called Fred who owns oh, who's the founder of an uh, organization called Green Card Organization and he 
I asked him, can I come and help and volunteer? Yes. And that was the end or the beginning of the journey that I've taken. Absolutely. Was that what brought you to putting up the Zuri Dada Sanitary Bank in Kibera? Yes. Tell us a bit about that. So when I started doing my, um, when I started mentoring and talking to the girls and just get, kind of getting an idea of, of, of what their challenges are, one of the things that really disturbed me was that young girls from the age of 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 were having sex in exchange for sex. Transactional sex, yeah. For sanitary pads because what that was actually that was not even what disturbed me it was the fact that they wanted to finish school to get out of poverty so education was the key word there mm. to get an education to leave poverty and that's the length a girl would take and i said no it can't be it can't happen it can't um so i decided from my own pocket mm -hmm. and with my friends let me set up like you know a sanitary pad bank where ev any girl who has her menaces can come and pick up a packet of sanitary pads and these were the ones that you were producing or you i since to... had put that on okay. the back burner All so right. i was now buying okay. my own All right. um and with well wishes and friends mm -hmm. who were donating that's now how we were um uh, basically storing our sanitary pad bank okay still is still right. are. now just looking at the fact that you were able to help address one bit of the whole um, sanitary hygiene management process what are some of those other challenges that you saw these girls having to go through because one you have been able to to some extent provide as many as you possibly can with sanitary towels but that's just one part of the menstrual hygiene uh, management process what are some of those other challenges that you saw that you feel so many people need to come together to fill in these gaps Challenges are many. You know, when one lives in poverty, um, there's challenges are many. So you find many girls are probably in homes that are with, uh, where they're living with a single parent. Yeah. They probably have four, five, six siblings. They're in a 10 by 10, which is a space this big. Um, they not only have, that is probably even just a small problem. There's a problem of, are we going to eat today? Mm -hmm. Are we going to have a roof tomorrow? Um, is my mother working? How are these, I mean, there's also school fees. You know, th there's one challenge that people don't realize is that, I'll say in Kibera alone, mm -hmm. there are about 330 schools in Kibera. Out of the 330 schools, only four are public, as in government schools, mm. which means the rest, and I'm talking from kindergarten to vocational, the rest you have to pay. So they're, pub they're private schools. So you find that not everybody can afford to go to school. And you know, when you tell people who are in middle upper class that, oh, you know, these kids are not going to school or they need sanitary pads, mm. the government provides public schools with sanitary pads yes but that's government they don't provide of course the private because you know so the challenge is there is school fees challenges mm -hmm. so you find girls are out of school or boys are out of school because the parents can't put them in school why because government schools are also full yeah so the challenges are food education so when it comes to sanitary pads, it's a, it's a little... It's, it's a, just part of the whole tree. Yeah, it's a drop in the oh. ocean, yeah. Now, also looking at, you know, the fact that COVID-19 happened and it has disrupted everyone on different levels, looking at what you have seen and especially how these young girls and disadvantaged uh, girls, for that matter, have been affected, and all the... Everyone in the value chain understanding that you can do something in whatever capacity that you are in. How can we help just cushion the challenges that have come along as a result of COVID-19 exacerbating the situation? So I have 
a spiritual teacher called Sadhguru. Mm -hmm. Sadhguru is Indian, and what I've, there's a question that was uh, uh, um, he was asked a question about poverty in India, and this person asked him, "Oh, you know, we're such a spiritual country. Why is it that we have poverty?" And he says, "Well, are you uplifting somebody? Mm -hmm. Because if you're not, then." you're asking me a very foolish question and it's the same answer I'll give you is our biggest problem and I saw it more so during COVID mm -hmm. during last year's uh, lockdown yeah we are not uplifting our own we're expecting these NGOs and these foreign you know mm. people to come and be our so-called saviors and that's where we've gone wrong. We are not uplifting our own. Mm. It's a huge challenge. It's a huge problem. It's a huge problem and it's a very sad problem. Now, as we close this conversation, as we look to stop delegating this responsibility of lifting up our own and understanding that, because many a times we're quick to say, I, what can I do? Me, I'm struggling to just even have a meal myself how am i supposed to be able to help the next person understanding that help comes in different forms yeah. and we have we can do something in whatever space that we are in what will be your message to our viewers today like you said help comes in different forms it doesn't have to be monetary mm -hmm. it can be just you going and giving your time you know your time talk to the girls the yes. girls there are many girls who just want to hear the word message of hope mm -hmm. that's it when they see they look you know they look at us from coming from outside I guess you could say the the informal settlement as miss as hope yeah so for them to see us go and take them ourselves to them it's a message of hope mm -hmm. and there'll be that one child who will look at you and just say I want to be like her and that's enough You've ignited a fire that was laying dormant. <laughs> All right. Now, due to the constraint of time, we have to close this conversation at that particular point. But we have been speaking with Njoki Karaoke. She is the managing director of Karji Industries Limited. If you would wish to help, I'm sure you can. Uh, we will be giving you her social handles uh, on our social media platforms. You can be able to assist in whatever way that you can. Thank you so much for making time to be with us today. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.